Thank you so much. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's panel. Um, I, I wanna start off with some introductions. Uh, first of all, the discussion today will be on big tech, uh, centering around the question of is tech too big? And is that a problem? Uh, we've got an excellent panel with us here today. Um, first and foremost, I'll introduce Wayne Brow, Brow who is the, uh, who's my colleague here at R Street. Uh, give me just one second. I'm a little bit of an issue on my side. Perfect. Uh, so Wayne Brow is the Senior Managing Fellow of our Technology and Innovation Team at R Street. Uh, we also have with us Rob Atkinson, who is the President of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Marianella Lopez Galdos, Global Competition Council, Computer and Communications Industry Association, and Elizabeth Frazee, co-founder and CEO of Twin Logic Strategies. I'm really excited for the conversation we're going to have today. If you have questions, please put those in the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, after introductory remarks from our panelists, we will have a chance to get to questions, and I would love to have a nice, robust discussion and address exactly what uh, you know, the burning issues are on your mind. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it off with our panelists, starting with Wayne. Uh, thank you, Ken Kenyon, and thank you, uh, everybody, for joining this, this conversation with R Street. Um, I just wanted to start, sort of talk about the, sort of set a, a little bit of a, a background framework for how the discussion will go, because it's a very important issue. Obviously, there's been a lot moving in the, in the tech space re recently. We've seen, uh, you know, just yesterday or, or a couple days ago, Facebook was under the gun. DOJ earlier had announced it. In investigations into Google. Uh, we've, we've seen the House Majority Report come out earlier this year with some sweeping recommendations for changes to the antitrust laws. And we also see uh, changes in the EU with respect to competition that I think are going to have a significant impact on American companies. So I, I think we have a very good panel here to, to discuss these issues. And I, as I said, I just want to start things off by, by sort of setting up a framework and, and looking at um, how we think about uh, big, how we think about tech, and is there anything different in, in terms of how we look at big tech, as we call it, versus how we looked at large industries throughout the history going back to the, the days of the trust, trust busters. And, and if you look at the history of, of how we looked at big companies, it, there's always been swings in, in, in the populist views and, and, and this notion that big is bad is sort of something that flows in and out of the conversation um, and it goes back even to the, the early days of, of when we were thinking about the robber barons. I um, mean, it goes through history to big oil, to big uh, you know, transportation. It, it just follows through uh, U.S. history, U.S. economic history. So it's important to, to look at this and see if, in fact, tech is different than what preceded it, or if, in fact, it, it's just another case of this industry in particular being under the gun for for what's happening in, in the in the antitrust world at large, um, and and if you look historically, you know back uh, when the Sherman Act was passed, just a little over 100 years ago, and then that was quickly followed by the Clayton Act, and these provided new tools for the government to to go after what they thought was uh, monopolist or anti-competitive behavior. But if you look at what happened with those industries as they, as they were uh, the trust busters were sort of putting their investigations into the field and going after, say, big oil or, or some of these early trusts, you actually see that, that prices were falling, um, output was expanding, and there was, there was innovation. So there was not a, a sense that, that these early trust busters were actually benefiting the economy writ large. Uh, and in fact, if you look at some of the writings of, of John Sherman, who's the, the father of our antitrust laws today, there was nothing in his writings that suggested he was there to uh, promote competition or, or, or lower prices. In fact, going through his letters, people have found that he was actually responding to a small set of interests that were concerned that they couldn't keep up with the, the innovations and competition from their larger rivals. Um, so, so throughout history, we have some questions as to what the role of the government is when they're actually intervening in, in the marketplace. Um, and so if we, if we want to understand today, and, and you look back through history, it you know, the network, obviously, there's, there's special uh, considerations for tech, but these large networks have, have gone through all the sectors of the economy. When we built our, our transportation infrastructure and the rail networks that, that, that uh, connected the nation, there, were, there was 
concerns about competition. Actually, there are still today. Um, and if you go to uh, through the agricultural sector and the innovations that occurred there, again, um, they were they were put under the microscope and they were they were sort of brought in for these anti-competitive anti behaviors. But it, it was something that happened industry through industry. And you know, in that sense, I don't think tech is anything special today. Um, the, the question is, you know, why is it different? And, and one of the things that, that a lot of people say is, well, tech is different because what they do is provide something that's free. So it, it's harder to, to use traditional tools of economics to understand how that market works. And again, I, I think, you know, if you look at in a little more detail, you know, the, there are in fact costs to what the what these tech companies do, and they're they're typically two-sided markets, and you have advertisers on one side. So things aren't really free. So there are there are markets at work here, even though from the consumer's perspective, it, it may seem to be free at, at, at one time. Um, but so I, I think you know I, what I want to say is there's only basically two ways to to allocate resources, and one is through having government interventions in the marketplace, maybe through tighter antitrust laws, maybe through tighter regulation through the FTC, or, or let markets themselves allocate resources. And I think over time, we've demonstrated that, that markets are very good at allocating resources. And any market-based economy tends to outperform uh, any planned economy. And because of that, I think it's important that as we think about antitrust, as we think about what we're doing in the tech sector, we don't want to disturb that allocative functions that markets perform. Um, and I think even in the tech space, they perform these functions very well. Um, but you know, one of the one of the things that we have to be concerned about, and this is a, a serious problem, I, I think, when we talk about these reforms, is the fact that there are a number of issues that are contentious, that that are causing you know concerns among consumers, consumer uh, businesses, and others um, related to tech. And that might be privacy, it might be uh, you know data protection might be content moderation, but all those are, are questions that are beyond the framework of antitrust. And I, I think if we want to tackle those, uh, antitrust is not the tool to do that. You, we can't shoehorn a lot of policy changes into uh, a, 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 a sort of tool for making sure that markets are efficient and making sure that markets are, are effective and open to competition. Um, that's, that's what the antitrust framework is, is all about and trying to get these other uh, concerns about big tech or, or technology into that um, framework, I think is gonna do more harm than good. So um, Congress has every right to, to go after those questions of, of data privacy and, and content moderation, but I would suggest not to do it through the, the framework of the, the antitrust laws. And, and so there, I think, I think I just wanna leave it at that and, and let the other panelists speak and, and hope we can return to some of the things during the, uh, the question and answer period. And Rob, I think I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Wayne and Canyon. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. And um, so, Wayne, you had you had brought up this notion of um, sort of this long tradition of you know going back and forth between a populist view and a, and a more I don't know accepting of, of growth and bigness view. Uh, I wrote a book with my colleague, Mike Lind, about a year and a half ago for MIT Press called Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business. And there's a wonderful quote we found, uh, uh, and it was a journalist, Dorothy Thompson, it was about almost a century ago now, and, and, and she wrote, quote, two souls dwell in the bosom of the American people. The one loves the abundant life. It's expressed by the cheap and plentiful products of large mass scale production and distribution. The other soul yearns for former simplicities, for decentralization, for the interests of the little man, denouncing monopoly and economic empires and seeks means of breaking them up. And I think that's really, to me, the core question here. We, we can get into, and I'm, I hope we do, sort of the specifics of antitrust law and, and how you apply the law and all that. But I don't think that's really fundamentally what's at stake here. What's really driving this is a fundamental disagreement uh, do you support growth or do you support redistribution? Do you prioritize competition above all else, including growth, innovation, and consumer welfare? Or do you see competition as being a means rather than an end? And are you size agnostic when it comes to businesses? I mean, I was struck in the Washington Post today, uh, uh, New York AG, uh, Letitia James was talking about the Facebook case that New York signed on to, and she one of the key reasons they signed on to it is because Facebook hurts small business. 
Uh, well, first of all, that's not true. But secondly, since when did the goal of economic policy be to help some class of businesses over another? I thought competition policy was supposed to be looking out for consumers. The other thing I think that gets missed in this debate constantly is they seem to, a lot of the antitrust, uh, whether it's the Neo Brandeisians or the other folks that have latched onto, the, onto these antitrust cases against big tech, they seem to think that the tech industry is the widget industry. Yeah, we don't have monopolistic dry cleaners. Well, there's a reason we don't have monopolistic dry cleaners it's because you don't have economies of scale scope or network effects in the dry cleaning industry. You know, one little dry cleaner can be as efficient as a, you know, a thousand put together. But that's not the case in tech. You have significant economies of scale and scope and network effects. I was even struck by the Cicilline report that acknowledged that. And the Cicilline report said, quote, in markets with increasing returns to scale, as sales increase, average unit costs decrease because entry into these markets requires significant upfront costs. The market favors firms that are already large. Uh, and then he goes on to say, well, that makes it difficult for new firms to enter the market. Why, why is that a problem? That is the nature of particular industries that they happen to have scale, they benefit from scale and consumers benefit from scale. Only if you sort of privilege small business and, and competition uberalis, do you think that's a problem? You know, there was another very good quote from the um, Obama Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, they did a report on antitrust and tech, which is amazing because it's only what, seven years ago, six years ago, but it seems like that's just an eons ago from where a lot of the progressive Democrats are today on, on antitrust. And the quote was, it said, quote, some newer technology markets are also characterized by network effects with large positive spillovers from having many consumers use the same product. Markets in which network effects are important, in which network effects are important, such as social media sites may become dominated by one firm. Yeah. How many of you uh, want to have both Facebook and Headbook? Oh, I've got to post twice now to everything because the government said we need competition in this. No, there's a reason why there's one Facebook, one Twitter, one LinkedIn because of network effects. And it just makes consumers' lives so much easier. I can talk to everybody, they can talk to me. So again, it's this notion that somehow these, these internet-based industries are somehow like widget industries and you can just by the force of government going in and sort of blowing things up, you can create competition, which I think is fundamentally wrong. Wayne, also you, you alluded to, which I'm not gonna to touch on in my remarks really, is the question is what's the relevant market? And that's the core question in all antitrust, or it should be the first question an antitrust investigator looks at. The relevant market here is not the consumer side of the market. Uh, there's an enormous amount of competition for consumer eyeballs. I can go to TikTok, I can do this. I can watch an R Street, you know, I'm not on Facebook right now. I'm watching an R Street, I'm talking an R Street video. I could be on YouTube, I could be watching television. That's not the market, it's a free service. So there's no market there. The market is on the ad side of the market. And that's really the question, is there market power in ads? If there is, maybe there's something to do. I don't think there is. And the last point I'll just make is, it's easy to forget, um, about what these firms actually provide the economy and, and, and us as consumers. Again, the Cicilline report, I was astounded by this statement in there. It said, quote, incumbent firms lack incentive to invest in R&D. Well, okay, let's look at the data. Um, the EU uh, puts out a report of the 5,000 top firms in R&D spending every year. And, and last year, which is the latest year now, um, Alphabet, which is Google, is ranked number one. Microsoft three, Apple six, Facebook 11. And they, they actually said in a footnote, Amazon would have been actually number one of all, but Amazon doesn't separate out their R&D and content. So what we're talking about are these monopolies who are investing vast amounts of money in R&D. You put all of that R&D together and it's more, it's essentially the equivalent of all corporate and government R&D in Great Britain. Facebook itself invests two thirds more in R&D than the National Science Foundation does. So these are not lazy monopolists who are sitting there trying to keep their cash and not invest in the next generation of products and services and innovations that are gonna benefit the world. And more importantly, or equally importantly, I should say, benefit US competitiveness. So I think it's easy to lose track of that and say, oh, well, small companies are innovative, big companies are not. Sometimes that's true. But certainly in this case, it's the opposite of true. The, you know, you look at the announcement recently from Google 
that they were able to use AI for protein folding. I mean, nobody thought you could do that. Uh, and name me the little startup with 12 people in a silicon garage who could afford to have all of the scientific and engineering talent to figure out protein folding with AI. How about Amazon Robotics? How about Google self-driving cars? You think Ford and Toyota and GM would have been anywhere near as far along with self-driving cars if they didn't face the competitive challenge from Google who can do that partly because they're so big, partly because they have cash, partly because they wanna invest in the future. So I'll just close by saying, I think it's super important to, as for antitrust regulators to focus on conduct. If there are things these firms have done that are anti-competitive in their conduct, great, let's have an investigation and let's courts decide that. But going after them for structural reasons, I think is a huge mistake and we're gonna end up all paying the price for it. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I believe Elizabeth is our next speaker. Fantastic. Thank you, Canyon. And thank you, R Street, for hosting this. And um, want to uh, just say how pleased I am to be with all these, all these great panelists. And I think I'm here in the role of historian. Um, I was a young attorney working at AOL in the late 1990s when the browser wars took place. And when Microsoft was under um, the, the microscope of the federal government and state AGs. I mean, I think everyone knows the history lesson from Microsoft that um, in 1998, 20 states and the DOJ brought a lawsuit against the company. Um, of course, the culmination of that didn't come for years later. Um, there was a federal lawsuit, a court case, Microsoft eventually settled and has lived under some quite significant conditions for the last 20 plus years. And um, I think we all know how it ended. Microsoft is an incredibly innovative, growing, vibrant company that is offering um, consumers and investors, uh, great opportunities and um, uh, investment on their dollars. And AOL has been relegated to a content provider, not that anything's wrong with that, mind you, but um, that was bought by Verizon Media. And we don't hear very much about AOL these days. And yet Microsoft has gone into new areas of business and um, is doing just great. And if anything, perhaps Facebook and Google can look at the example of Microsoft and realize that um, their future probably is still bright in spite of the lawsuits and that um, they, will, they will likely do just fine. I think the Microsoft case was an instance of um, actual, uh, there was some evidence that came forward that um, Microsoft was trying to kill Netscape. And um, some witness testimony came forward where executives actually talked about that in meetings. And that was at the point where David Boyce, um, who brought the case for DOJ, uh, what knew that he wanted to go forward with a lawsuit in court as opposed to a settlement with the company um, before the court case. And um, there was uh, anti-competitive activity by Microsoft. They were bundling the, um, the browser with their operating system and they were trying to serve as gatekeepers, which is reminiscent of what we have heard alleged by the House Judiciary Committee Democrats against Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. So that theme of gatekeeper and the power that is used by um, some who are threatened by competitors is what is predominant through all of this. But um, as, I, as I said, Microsoft is living under conditions. 
Um, they have, uh, they, would, they would tell you, I'm sure, they would tell us today that those conditions are unfair, um, but they are thriving and um, they did suffer a bruising federal court battle and um, the government did find that they repeatedly violated the nation's antitrust laws, but um, they changed their corporate behavior and I am, I am sure that um, if at the end of the day, Facebook and Google have to live under conditions, they will um, find, find a way to do that. Um, what is different 20 years later? I think it's the amount of dominance that the, the big tech players have in our lives. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google have a combined valuation of more than five trillion as of September. Um, they're employing millions and generating trillions for the economy. Obviously, that wasn't the case in the late 90s with Microsoft um, and, and with tech in general. So the power of the tech sector has grown and that's probably why we're seeing tech lash and why we're seeing um, members of Congress and state attorney generals on both sides of the aisle decide to weigh in with a focus on these big companies today, in spite of all the benefits that the companies are providing us in our everyday lives. I mean, you noted that during this pandemic, we've all become even more reliant on them. And um, so I, I will look forward to um, future conversation about what we're likely to see from Congress um, coming next year and um, whether we're likely to see some changes to the antitrust laws that are being advocated by House Judiciary, maybe not um, uh, advocated in the Senate yet. So looking forward to that conversation and with that, I'll leave it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Marianella? Yeah. Sure, so first of all, let me thank our street for having me in this panel. It's always a pleasure to, to speak and sh to share views with all of these distinguished speakers. Um, I think many of the ideas that I wanted to bring to you in my initial remarks have been uh, already discussed. So I'll try to be brief so we can um, actually have a more dynamic conversation in the second part of, of this program. I think this panel cannot be more timely, but not only because of yesterday's announcement into Google's uh, into Facebook uh, investigation, but also into Google's investigation from a couple of weeks ago, but also the UK put forward some suggested ideas for implementing legislation this week. And Australia has tabled its uh, draft code of conduct to its parliament, I think it was yesterday. So it's not only a US phenomenon, it goes around the world. So it's, uh, I think, very important that we have in this conversation. I think I wanna, um, summarize the ideas that I wanted to put on the table for the discussion into three ideas, basically. The first one is that given the title of this event, I think it's important uh, to remark something that Rob had already mentioned before, which is that in terms of antitrust enforcement, we really need to be size agnostic. The size of a company doesn't matter for antitrust. I mean, this, the fact that some companies grew big it's just uh, a representation of how successful that they have become. And that is not bad. Whether they deserve more scrutiny because they became big, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that they are bad just because they are big. And that's very important to remark. And given that most of the big tech companies as they call them are in the US, I think we need to be aware and we need to acknowledge that the different incentives in different jurisdictions are diverse. I mean, and we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that because they are big, they are bad, and therefore any antitrust action, it's uh, valid and good for consumers. So what authorities need to prove first in order to, to make a, an antitrust case, as, as basic as it sounds, is to prove dominance in a relevant market that is correctly defined. I mean, and that is often not the case in some of the, the, the actions that we're seeing lately being announced. So um, I think that uh, in that respect, 
I mean, once you determine dominance, yes, then you focus on, 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 on conduct and then you determine whether consumers have been harmed or not and what remedies you can impose if there is harm. And if that is the case, I think everybody will be supportive of having antitrust enforcement because that is why the antitrust system is there for to restore competition when the consumer, when the welfare of consumers have been harmed, but not because the political dialogue says they are too big and therefore they, 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 it's very scary and, and we can't have such big companies, at least not from the antitrust perspective. Whether there are other political concerns that you may have for having big companies, that's a different dialogue that we should keep out of the antitrust debate. Um, so yeah, my first idea is prove dominance and then engage in, into the investigation of conduct that harms consumers. Just don't say, or we should avoid just saying bigness is, is the problem, et cetera. The second idea that I wanted to uh, bring to you is that, as I mentioned before, we see a lot of regulatory experimentation, as I want to call it. And, you know, it's a risk exercise. It's a risky exercise. We've never seen this before. And there's a lot to lose if the regulatory experiment in execution goes wrong. And what I mean by this is that I believe that last year we, we observed a lot of efforts and endeavors from many, many jurisdictions around the globe to conduct market studies and to um, uh, commission papers to very good economists and lawyers to try to identify what the problems are in the digital economy, why there are big companies, whether there are barriers to entry or what are the problems. If you look at those reports, none of them included a section that said, you know, and this is the recipe to solve them. This has changed this year as of uh, a couple of weeks ago where we see, or where we start to see a lot of suggestions for new legislation just uh, like three hours ago, there was a leak from the DMA from coming from the European Commission that is supposed to be announced next week where they will change the regulatory framework uh, to tackle the problems that might exist in the digital economy according to them. Well, whereas I think that many of the debates that have been going on are extremely interesting, I've never been, uh, I've never enjoyed my job so much working in the antitrust field has become really, really fascinating. I think there's a lot missing in the debate and raising and jumping to see who puts the legislation first on the table might be problematic if the, the markets haven't been understood to the fullest extent. First of all, I think in a couple of years, we, we will stop talking about uh, the digital economy because everything is going to be digital. There's no way backwards. Like we're all going to digitize our lives in a way. All type of companies from agriculture to minery to art to obviously the, the, the leading companies in the tech sector will continue to, to invest in innovation and offer new products and services for consumers. So first of all, I think we have to kind of stop making that distinction between the digital economy and the non-digital economy because everything is gonna be digital. But most importantly to me, one of the concepts that is not fully understood, and Dr. Tease talks a lot about this, is how these leading digital uh, companies that have changed the world and the way we operate, I think um, we, we've all survived much better to the, the pandemic or we are surviving better to the pandemic thanks to, thanks to the, 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 the availability of the internet and the services we can, we can find there is that in, the, in this case, innovation drives competition. And what do I mean by that? Right now, if you look at how these companies operate, yes, you know, Facebook might be more prominent in the social uh, network space and Google might be more prominent in the search uh, sector. And then, you know, we see that each of these companies has like a core service they provide, but they compete in so many other sectors. And when a company puts out an idea there, all these companies innovate, invest, and deploy a lot of resources, especially human capacity, to try to think of new products and new services that will be able to compete with existing um, services that consumers like. So for example, I don't think we will see a new search tool that will debunk 
Google. What I would think is that we will see a new service, a completely new service, probably through voicemail, that consumers will like more, and then that will compete and now compete uh, Google search, for example. So I think it's very important to understand the notion that innovation drives competition. And uh, if we if if we jump into excuse me, I have a a little cold here, not COVID. Um, if we if we jump to regulate uh, these dynamics without fully understanding them, we might really stifle innovation away. And the the other the only ones that are going to suffer are, is going to be consumers and the economy as a whole. And my last my last point, and I think Rob also touched upon this, is that one of the most interesting questions that I think we haven't found an answer to is how do we reconcile competitiveness with competition in a sector with, where economies of scale and scope are important? And where do you want to be as a nation in terms of tech industry? Like if you start breaking up companies, other jurisdictions are going to grow their own. And in this really type of services, uh, I think uh, we have to be very careful with that, with undermining the growth of the economy and with undermining successful companies that really are pushing the economy forward. And I think I'll stop here and happy to engage in the conversation. Thank you so much. All right, that, in, that concludes the uh, prepared remarks section of our event. Um, I would again like to remind everybody that if you have any questions for our awesome panelists, please put them into the Q&A section and I will grab those so that we can ask them and uh, encourage the conversation. I am going to take moderator's privilege and ask the very first question. Um, I, I really like where Marianella what was going with that and the, the inter international perspective. I also really appreciate our historical perspective, especially from Elizabeth and Rob. I kind of want to start tying a few of these things together. So if I can start off with Wayne and kind of uh, touch on something that Marianella was talking about, which is the consumer welfare standard. Can you explain to me why that is being debated so fiercely and why the consumer welfare uh, standard is so important? I'm sorry, was that to me? Or that no, was to Wayne. Wayne. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the consumer welfare standard was an important development and it happened sort of in the 70s. And what it, what it, what was, what it took care of was before the consumer welfare standard was in place, um, the jurisdiction and, and the legal outcomes of, of antitrust cases were all over the map. There was no real way to sort of guess which, which company was going to win in one of these fights. And there was no real underlying principle as to why a, a case went, went one way or another. The consumer welfare standard came in and sort of rationalized how we look at problems of competition. And the basic idea was if consumers are better benefiting, if output is, is increasing, if innovation is occurring, um, and if, if there's other, the ability of other firms to get into that marketplace, we don't need to be imposing new antitrust uh, enforcement actions against those companies. So I, I think in, in that respect, I think the consumer welfare standard was an important piece of the puzzle in terms of trying to make sure that if in fact a, a company was brought into the courts for allegedly being anti-competitive, there was a, a, a standard by which all firms could be measured. Um, and that measure, I, and I think you know, if you look historically, uh, since the, the implementation of the consumer welfare standard, um, I, I think we've done a lot better in terms of serving consumers and avoiding unnecessary uh, breakups of firms that are, are in fact efficient. Because a, a lot of times, you know, firms are big because they're effective. They, they are efficient and they can serve consumers better than their competitors. And that's not a reason to be bringing an antitrust case. So consumer welfare standard was a way to go in and say, well, wait a minute, you know, we see prices falling, we see consumers better off, why are we bringing this case? So uh, that's an important piece of the puzzle and it's different. I think it distinguishes us from Europe and other countries and maybe Marinella can tell us about, a little bit about that because there they don't have this idea of a consumer welfare standard and there they have a lot more discretion in terms of how they, these suits get settled. And oftentimes it's arbitrary and, and quite frankly, it, it's you know, easy to hit American companies with billion dollar fines and we see it over and over again because there no, there's no real standard to stop that. 
And that, that's exactly the, the follow-up question that I wanted to have was for Marianella. I, I would wonder if you could kind of, uh, you know, explain a little bit more, you know, how does the EU differ from the US in not using the consumer welfare standard? How do they do things instead? And is it better? So I think the answer, it's a complex one because the European Union in and of itself, it's a complex political construction. Um, in that regard, the integration of the different member states has always played a, an important role, even in competition enforcement. So the, we do in Europe understand the consumer welfare, but it's not an exclusive um, principle through which antitrust is enforced. There are other principles such as the integration of, um, of Europe and even fairness, which the courts have actually recognized. I think, um, in this, in this respect, I also think it's very important to, when it comes to tech, right? I think it's very important to understand the background and the history of each of the jurisdictions and what the industry looks like. And if you look at Europe right now, I think like a big company, they only have Spotify, uh, which, you know, in a way shows that it's not that Europe cannot do it, but they've been lagging a little bit behind in terms of um, promoting innovation, a, a place where, in the US, it has worked perfectly well, the incentives to innovate, even to the, the, the mere existence of in the past Microsoft and now other tech companies and the possibility of being acquired as an exit strategy is just uh, in, implies a lot of good incentives for risk takers to innovate. And that is not so the case in Europe. So many of the actions that we see reflect the reality of the industrial landscape in Europe. And that's something that needs to be taken into account because oftentimes when, when I listen to some of the conversations that are taking place in the US, they say, oh, but look at Europe, they've been doing X, Y, Z, but here in the US we're behind. Well, I think the answer is that Europe and the US are different. The incentives are, it's like comparing Europe, the US to, to China, you know, they have a big tech industry, which was all uh, created through public investment. I'm not judging that, I'm just saying that they have different industrial policy regimes which have resulted in different successful or unsuccessful results. And many of the regulatory uh, proposals that we're seeing these days do take into account that background. So I think if I, I mean, I'm not American, but if I were an American, I wouldn't want to destroy the ecosystem that has been created in the US where innovation is fierce job creation is good. And, and basically you could, <laughs> the US tech industry is changing the, the way we, we, we work, uh, I think for good. But that's why we, when, when we talk about Europe, the US or other jurisdictions, I really think that it is important to take into account the background, the historical background and the political background that is uh, promoting the different, different uh, proposals. Very good, excellent. Um, and and on that same kind of note, I, I wanted to uh, turn to Elizabeth and and see if I could get some of that kind of historical and American business perspective. You know, in particular, you know, Marianella talked about how um, we are we are a driver of innovation. The way that we do things, the consumer welfare standard, it drives innovation. And there's I think a good reason that we have so many of the top tech companies, while e the Europe basically has Spotify. Um, I would like to get your perspective as someone who has worked for a big, you know, quote unquote, big tech company, AOL, you know, when you were working there, was it a foregone conclusion that AOL was one day going to be relegated to kind of a, a sideshow? Uh, or was the idea that they were going to be the dominant tech firm and they were a monopoly and we have to do something about this? And, and can you speak to how that might, uh, you know, show our inability to predict things very accurately? Absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head that um, it is extremely hard to predict. When I was working with Steve Case, who was seen as a visionary, and um, while he didn't build the internet, he certainly advanced it. And we were working on the cutting edge of policy decisions that would have huge impact on the growth of the internet. No one could foresee that Google and Facebook and Amazon and all of the others would have the impact that they are having today. And government can't predict 
industry can't even predict. And um, we shouldn't be in the, the habit of picking winners and losers and completely agree with Marinella that just because companies are big does not mean that they're bad. And in the case of Microsoft, it was Microsoft's behavior to stop the growth of their competitors that the government was looking at. And, you know, Microsoft was blocking the growth of Netscape. And um, it was that specific behavior under the microscope. Nobody, I think, is, is saying that just because companies have dominance means it's a bad thing. It's how did they get there? And I'll be really um, interested to see the breakdown in Congress over um, uh, whether the, the Google and Facebook suit lawsuits are actually a reason to push the pause button and on some of the antitrust legislation to say, well, clearly the government has been able to bring these cases. So maybe they do have what they need to do that. Maybe the agencies need some more resources, um, but maybe we don't need a change in the laws. Maybe the laws are dynamic and that two, two sentence antitrust law um, is that was from the what 1930s is able to keep up with technology today. I would just say finally, it's all cyclical. You know, um, no one's talking. Uh, we, we lived through the breakup of AT&T back in the early 80s. And um, the world's a very different place today, but AT&T is still extremely powerful. And um, like Microsoft, doing fine in the marketplace. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm definitely you know to, to kind of combine the, the comments that you were making with Marianella's. I you know I'm very skeptical of this the more European model of you know protecting competitors instead of consumers because who do you choose to protect? Who do you prop up? Who do you allow to fail? Do you allow anyone to fail? You know, might we still have a, an AOL you know monopoly today if they had been you know, supported by the government in some way or their competitors have been regulated out of the field. And I really want to, uh, you know, include Rob in this conversation. Rob, I apologize for getting to you last, but that are, somebody has to go last. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it comes to you. But um, I really want to get your perspective on this, particularly on what Elizabeth was talking about now, which is that historical perspective. And going back, you know, I know that you, you've done a lot of research on antitrust laws going backwards. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the Sherman Act. Do you think that the Sherman Act was passed to put an end to big business? Or did even the early trust busters see a role for large companies? Well, my, my colleague, Mike Lind, and I wrote a piece of the New Republic about that, sort of uh, rebutting this common view. In fact, one of the common views is that TR, uh, Teddy Roosevelt hated big business. He didn't. But the Sherman Act was really going against were trusts, uh, informal co co uh, you know, cooperation or collusion. In fact, it was interesting. The reason we are superior in so many ways to the European economy uh, was because they enabled trust. They let trust exist. So their firms never got, I shouldn't say there, but many of their firms in many industries never got scale. They never got big. We said in the US, you can't collude, but if you want to merge, go ahead um, with some, you know, some limitations on that. So our firms merged. And that was really the single most important thing to drive American leadership in the 20th century. You know, U.S. Steel, uh, General Electric, uh, you name it. But then by really by the middle of the 20s, we started to have second thoughts. And I would actually, I think if you look at the history of this, which I've done in, a, in that piece, but also in a recent piece on the, the rise and fall of Lucent. So why don't we have a telecom equipment firm anymore in, in a journal called American Affairs? What was interesting is, is um, Lucent's predecessor was Western Electric, uh, was you know, the biggest exporter in the world, one of the largest firms in the world. Uh, the Antitrust Bureau of DOJ went to it in 1925 and forced it for no reason to divest itself of all of its foreign assets. So they had factories in almost every country. Those all get sold off and they were sold to ITT, which essentially sold them off to these national champions. That's where a lot of these countries got their telecom firms because we made that mistake. In the 1950s, 
the antitrust uh, people don't recognize it. The, the DOJ in 1950s, I think there must have been something in the water they were drinking because because they went absolutely bonkers. They forced uh, Western Electric to divest its Canadian subsidiary. And guess what happened? That became Nortel, which became a very powerful firm, which was quite instrumental in having Lucent uh, go out of business. So if we'd had that combined assets there in North American, as opposed to splitting them up, and then Nortel went out of business because it was weakened. We did the same thing with RCA. Nobody remembers that. <clears throat> RCA was <clears throat> the Google of its time. It was the largest tech company in the world. Uh, as everybody knows, Radio Corporation of America it was actually formed by FDR when he was Secretary of the Navy. The bottom line is they were the most innovative electronics company. And there was a study done that showed that their, quote, monopoly raised the prices of color TVs by 2%. Uh, but the, their overall innovation in, in how they made TVs ended up lowering the prices because all their competitors could copy them uh, from sort of, you know, things they learned. Anyway, bottom line is they forced RCA to, to give away for free every single patent that it had to other American companies. So what did they do? They did what they'd always done, which is they licensed it. Only this time they licensed it to companies like Sony. That is single-handed why the Japanese have beaten us in consumer electronics. Single-handed. Uh, same thing with Xerox. Uh, the FTC brought a case against Xerox, and the head of the antitrust bureau said, or the economist at the time said, I won't be happy until we cut Xerox's market share in half. Lo and behold, and what they did, not only patents, but drawings, blueprints, everything had to be given up. And they did cut Xerox's market share in half in about six years to Japanese firms, Ricoh, Canon. So if you're a sort of, you know, if you don't mind the government going in with heavy hands and also saying all we care about are, uh, is competition, the result will be significantly weakened American firms and, and, and frankly less innovation. So I think it's really incumbent upon people today who want to do the exact same thing as before, explain to us why now won't be any different than what happened in the past, because there are lots of foreign companies waiting in the wings out there to take advantage of this. I love the example of RCA. I think that that's you know just another of the long list of companies that were at one time monopolies. Uh, you know, yeah. and I look at the uh, you know blockbuster Hollywood video and all of the the rancor that there was about them and how they were controlling the video space. Um, I, I you know I think the only one left is in Alaska now, uh, the only blockbuster. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just approach all of those uh, you know ideas of this is a monopoly, that's a monopoly with a lot of skepticism, especially in the tech space. And I, I'm wondering. I just say quickly goes to Mary Ellen, Ellen point is it's trumpetarian competition. You know, if you're worried about these monopolies, just support innovation because eventually innovation is going to get you something different and more and, and a new competitor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I wanted to also bring in Wayne to this part of the discussion. Um, Wayne, can you talk to us about how did economists feel about these early trust buster efforts and the implementation of the Sherman Act that uh, Rob was just talking about? I, I think it, it, it sort of adds to, to what Rob was saying is that most economists at the time were, were not enthusiastic about, about in, implementing the, uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act. They saw that, um, in fact, there were economies of scale and, you know, they hadn't had the same level of, you know, the, the field of industrial organization wasn't that, you know, rich at that point, but they did see economies of scale as something that benefited the economy. It provided innovation. And, you know, one of the examples from then is, you know, the, you know, the big concern that, 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 Standard Oil brought a lot of it was because of the they shifted to using tanker cars instead of barrels for for transporting their oil and it was much cheaper it was much safer more efficient and it, it was something that that served consumers well um, but the people that were pressuring and writing letters to to John Sherman at the time were these smaller interests who were still using barrels and and didn't feel that they could compete with the, these innovators and and again this makes the case that you do want innovation. Because um, that's what's going to drive uh, consumer welfare and, and, and consumer well-being, and um, it, it'll drive competition in markets. Because as long as people can innovate, you can innovate your your way around uh, a, a monopoly. Because most monopolies over time are temporary. You know, most economists look at a monopoly as something, unless there's a sort of a government uh, regulation behind it that that enforces that monopoly. There's always people nipping at your heels to, to take your place. And I think that's, that's the benefit of being innovative and being competitive. And if we allow that process to take place, uh, you know, I, I think we're all better off as, as a country because it, it 
adds to our bottom line of GDP and we're all better off as consumers because we have more products at cheaper prices. I appreciate that. And I, I like looking at the, the history of this because I think it, it gives a lot of clarity to our current day discussion. And, you know, in particular, I, I'm, I'm stricken that it doesn't seem like uh, a lot of these arguments are new. R Rob, could you kind of speak to that? You know, is, uh, is the backlash, the tech lash that we're seeing today, is that unique? Is this, you know, new to these modern companies? Or is it the same thing that we saw basically with RCA and similar entities? Well, there's a uh, there's a wonderful book that um, uh, Chandler wrote uh, on uh, historian from Harvard on on the emergence of the industrial revolution in the U.S. in the late 1890s and early and he said if there was modern polling back then Americans would overwhelmingly have opposed the rise of industrialization. Thankfully, there was not modern polling because that was. You know, do we, you know, other than Matt Stoller, I don't think anybody wants to go back and live in the in the late 1800s with, uh, you know, a tenth of our income kind of thing, and all the little we're all working at little craft businesses. Although sometimes I think think tanks are craft businesses, but uh, you need economies of scale there. Maybe some mergers. Maybe R Street and ITIF can merge, and then we can put Birkings out of business. <laughs> but so the point the point being that. Um, Historically, in the U.S., we've, you know, as Wayne said, we've generally sort of supported this, but occasionally these things pop up. So the rise of populism in the progressive era equated uh, some of that concern. Uh, something similar in the 50s, uh, when you had the Harvard Conduct Structure Performance Model of antitrust, where it was, you know, any market share above X percent uh, was was seen as uh, as a de facto violation. That's why. I've, we have the famous case, Vaughn's Grocery Store, when they were going to merge with some other grocery store in LA. I think it would, I don't know, what would they have, 12% of the market, and it was rejected by, by DOJ. You know, it was sort of went crazy. And that was in part, that's, that was a response. The Chicago School was a response to that sort of going too far the other way. But now what we have is this, is this Neo Brandeisian approach. I mean, Brandeis at one point famously said that um, bigness is the mark of Cain. And what he meant by that was there was no economies of scale, there was no efficiencies. The only way a firm got big was by sinning. I mean, clearly that's not the case. Some firms sin and hopefully they get prosecuted, but most of them don't. Last thing I'll just make, I know you, you'd said earlier about, about Consumer Welfare Center, why is it under threat or why is it being challenged? And it's being challenged for the simple reason that if you abide by the consumer welfare standard, it's very hard to do a lot of what they want to do. There's a very good article that we reviewed in our book. I, I think it was the Boston Review, but I'm, I'm blanking on it. It was about a, it was a bunch of Neo Brandeisians in a, in a sort of a forum. And one of them said, look, we can't rely on the consumer welfare standard because everybody loves Amazon so much. We have to find other reasons to go after Amazon because it's so good for consumers. We have to find some other reason. <laughs> so that's a big part of it. It really, at the end of the day, it, it boils down to we just don't like big firms. We don't like an economy with big firms. And this is Matt Stoller's whole point. Well, if you abide by the consumer welfare standard, then you can't really go after big firms because they're so good for consumer welfare. That's really great. I, I appreciate that. And I think that also dovetails with, you know, kind of another thing that I wanted to, to get to on in this discussion. You know, we've talked a lot about the past, but I kind of want to spend a little bit of time, at least in our, our last little bit here, uh, talking about the here and now and kind of the future. Um, so I want to start with Marianella and say, can you tell us a little bit more about how you know, we, earlier the antitrust reports from the House Antitrust Subcommittee were, were mentioned. Um, you know, and I'm wondering if you can give us a, a little bit of analysis on how uh, proposed reforms in the U.S. differ from proposed reforms elsewhere, such as the European Union and other countries. Right. So, um, so as I mentioned, this week and next, we will see, uh, or we have seen new proposals to regulate. I think the, the essence of those regulations are even if they don't say it obviously to curb down uh, successful tech companies that coincidentally uh, are Americans. Um, I find it a little bit um, hard to accept regulations that discriminate or are too targeted at certain companies will be successful. I think uh, if you think you need to regulate, I can I can live with that, but then let's regulate on their principles. And that's not something that we are seeing across the globe. And I think that's something that is going to differ widely from the US. It would get to the point that they um, 
change the U.S. antitrust system. I'm with Elizabeth here that uh, many of the claims that have been made in the past two years is that the U.S. antitrust system doesn't work to tackle anti-competitive behavior from big tech companies. I think the fact that we have two big cases now ongoing prove the opposite. So we might see a, a different angle from which these conversations will take place, and I hope so. Um, I do think that uh, yesterday's case raises concerns on over the merger control regime in the US. Um, we'll see how that develops. Uh, it's hard to prove that uh, what the market would have looked like without a merger. I think it's very, very hard to prove. I'm not an economist. I don't even know how they could possibly do that. We'll see that. But we might see changes in the US or we might see more targeted discussions towards merger control in the US, but not really changing the US antitrust system and definitely not regulating in a discriminatory fashion. Uh, in the rest of the world, I just think they're missing the opportunity to, if they think there's a need for regulation, to do it under principles of market economy. And I think it's risky. And I think at the end of the day, if the experiment doesn't work well, the ones that are going to be harmed the most are either Europeans or British or people or Australians. So I think I'm very interested in observing the different uh, developments. Um, I'm not sure whether they're going to be successful. I think they're risky. And, and I think that's, that's perfect because I also wanted to bring Elizabeth into this part of the discussion. Um, you know, given, given kind of what Mary Neal was talking about, uh, you know, a lot of the concerns that we see uh, around, quote unquote, you know, big tech actually do, are about things like data privacy and data protection and those kind of issues. Um, you know, and that kind of gets into this, why this fear of the big, you know, they're so big and they have so much information. So I'm afraid of them. Do you think it would be more productive for Congress to focus on particular issues that have worried them, you know, such as data privacy and data protection, rather than these broader, you know, trying to kind of blow up the antitrust regime that we've created based on a consumer welfare standard? Canyon, you're presuming that Congress can get anything done right now. <laughs> and we've seen with the uh, COVID stimulus that um, it's really hard, even in the middle of a pandemic, to, to get people to agree on economic stimulus. And I, I do think it would be productive for them to agree to federal data protection um, legislation, and uh, they've been trying to do that for the past 10 years now, and still comes down to debate over private right of action and preemption, same topics we've been talking about for eons. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we may see some changes around the margins on antitrust where they'll be able to agree. I was quite um, struck by the fact that Ken Buck, who tends to be a populist Republican, um, maybe the next head of the next ranking Republican on the antitrust subcommittee and House Judiciary, mm -hmm. that he agreed with a lot of what the Democrats said um, in their report that they issued. And um, there, there may be some areas of consensus, but then again, Republicans in the Senate probably don't agree with Ken Buck. So um, they may end up nibbling around the margins and doing things like um, I mentioned, you know, more resources for enforcement, or um, there's been a push to um, make, you know, DOJ and FTC instead of having two enforcement um, bodies, having one. And you know, those conversations probably will continue. I don't know that they'll be able to get agreement on things like structural remedies. And um, you know, those, those things are gonna be tough to get bipartisan agreement on for good reason. I appreciate that. And I normally take a lot of solace in Congress's inability to get anything done when it comes to making sure they don't do bad things. Uh, but like you said, the, you know, the Buck report echoing so much of the, the Democratic majority, uh, that does start to make me a little nervous that we end up with some kind of, you know, bipartisanship that is uh, truly terrible. 
Uh, but don't want to end on a bad note, but I think that that is actually an optimistic note that we won't see uh, you know, any bad action on antitrust uh, enforcement, uh, even if it's just because Congress can't agree on what to do. Uh, so I think we're, we're hitting two o'clock, uh, which is the uh, end of our event time. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us. This has been an awesome discussion. I've really enjoyed it. I think each of you brings a unique perspective to the discussion that is really valuable. Um, I hope that everyone watching will engage with us more on this issue going forward. Uh, you know, this video will be recorded, so you can share it with your friends if, uh, if they're interested in this type of issue. Uh, you know, check out rstreet.org for more information. And I think that's pretty much it. Thank you.